begin with uh, the student session and uh, what we would uh, basically cover would be uh, to, to learn some skills uh, on how to be effective in terms of uh, disciple making overseas. Well, uh, if you look at scriptures, uh, it's very clear that there's a money to go and make disciples of all nations. And we believe that the bottom line is there. As we make disciples, that should lead to uh, churches planted. You know, as, we, as we reach out to people, we evangelize, that will lead us to see churches planted. Because what you like to see as you go to the mission field is not just to see, share the gospel, not just to make disciples, but eventually we want you to see churches planted and established. And churches that will be multiplying. You know? So we will try to look into uh, some principles and some very, very basic skills that we can use so that we can be involved in the artists. Okay, so uh, let me begin by talking about how we can actually raise workers for the global harvest. And I, I really believe that as we train and equip them here uh, in, in the Philippines or in our local churches, then we would be able to raise more workers for the harvest. Okay, so let's continue. Raising workers for the global harvest. And of course, in the Great Commission, we're mandated to go and make disciples of all nations. Notice the emphasis, make disciples, and the focus should be all nations. Okay? And we all know that nations does not refer to countries. Nations would refer to people groups or ethnic groups. So the mandate is to make disciples of all nations. So how do we raise workers for the global harvest? First, let's begin by answering the question, why do we do, even have to do this? Why do we need to train? Why do we need to raise more missionaries? Why? Because people are lost without Jesus. And there is no hope apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's precisely the bottom line, why we are here. We want to raise more workers. We want to raise more missionaries. We want to really see the church involved because people are lost without Christ. Secondly, we need to be involved in the proclamation of the gospel because uh, we want to see people, uh, you know, realize that they need Christ. So the gospel must be proclaimed because the Bible says faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. Unless they hear the gospel, then how can they believe uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ and receive the offer of eternal life? And uh, I'm also convinced that the best way to evangelize is to be planting churches. Okay, so uh, if, if you are like uh, part of one church here, and then uh, you're just in one community, you can reach out and evangelize to the people only in your community. But what about like uh, 100 uh, miles away or 100 kilometers away? It would be difficult to reach out there, especially in other countries. However, as you train and equip your people here, then you may be able to send missionaries, right? That we also do ministry there. So if, if that's the case, then you reach out to people here, but also you're having more opportunities to reach out to people in those places where you will be planting churches. So uh, now as we are in, in embarking into a new uh, church planting initiative in the Philippines, we are really convinced that all the more we need to plant churches because that's a very effective way to evangelize. Because in our churches, if our people are equipped to share the gospel, then we will be able to see more of the Christ. Now, uh, there are different move movements of God in the world today. And, uh, you know, we see churches growing. Uh, and, and we see God's people involved in the process of evangelism uh, and in the process of making disciples that will result in church growth. So we, we are seeing churches growing because people are evangelizing and God's people are, are actually making disciples. But uh, there are countries or places where there are restrictions to the gospel, where you cannot grow big churches, right? But all you can do is have small, small churches in different locations, especially in restricted access countries. You cannot have uh, big churches, but you can have a lot of small churches. And uh, we have seen also that small churches, even in China, uh, in the Middle East, are really growing fast. In, in fact, it's faster than, you know, a big church, uh, not planting another big church. But anyway, uh, we have also seen that a combination would really be good. In fact, here in the Philippines, 
receive most churches do the both. So they grow the mother church so that they have resources, but at the same time they begin planting churches also and multiplying churches in different parts of the country and, and even beyond the borders of the country. Now, uh, for us to really understand and appreciate what we're talking about, let's have a definition of a church because, you know, if we have a wrong definition, then uh, it may, uh, you know, not really help us appreciate what we're talking about. Now, what is a church? A church is not a place or a location. Many are really having this misunderstanding. They thought the church is the building, it's the place where they meet. But what is a church? It's the church is the people, God's people. Now, these are cold ones, meaning they are out of the world, seem uh, sinners, but because of God's amazing grace, they have been redeemed. And now they are gathered, congregated as a church. And oftentimes it stops there. But a church really has to be scattered. Not to be scattered in the neg negative sense of the word, but to be scattered to be able to proclaim the goodness of the gospel. That's why the Great Commission were to go and make disciples. We cannot just stay in the formals of our churches. We have to go. We have to leave the comforts of our churches and go where the people are. Make disciples. In Mark 28, in Mark 16, 15, go and preach the gospel. We cannot just sit down here and wait for people to come and preach the gospel to me. No. But we have to go where they are. So as we do that, then we are scattered so that we will be able to share of the love of Christ even for uh, for others of that get on Christ. So it's it's not the building, but it's uh, it's God's people, the called up ones to redeem the gathered and eventually scattered. Now a church also is not a monument or a building, but it is a movement. A movement. Why? Because we want people to reproduce their lives in the lives of others. Go and make disciples, that's a mandate. So as we are being disciples, we are to make disciples. And our disciples need to make disciples. And our disciples, disciples should be making disciples. In other words, it's a movement. No, it's, it's a movement. So we want to see that happening. Because uh, what is actually the problem in many churches now, that uh, there is no movement happening. You know, I, uh, there's a discipleship group, they are very proud. Oh, Pastor, for the last 10 years, we have been faithfully meeting every week as a discipleship group. Praise God. But the problem is, it's only this group meeting. They are not even discipling others. Something is wrong there. Because disciples should be making disciples. Real disciples should be making disciples. So there should be a movement. We'll talk more about that in the uh, coming session. Well, a church is not an institution, but it is a living organism. It's alive. It, and therefore, because it's living, it should be growing. Churches that are not growing, churches that are not reproducing, or Christians that are not growing, Christians that are not reproducing and multiplying, well, something is wrong there. But living organism, that should be the church, and that should be the believer also. So, we want to see multiplication to take place. Now, living things multiply. Dead things don't multiply, but living things multiply. And it should be producing more fruit. Well, if you go to the supermarket, you see a lot of watermelons. And this is a very classic example. Get one watermelon and you see a lot of seeds in it, right? But all you need is one small seed. Plant the seed and you produce a lot of watermelons. This is what we, what we would like to see. In our churches, one disciple will be reproducing Many disciples. But what's the situation now? A disciple is only a disciple and never disciple. Uh, yeah, so it's a problem. No? We have to stop that because that's not what it should be. That's why I, I, I thought I, I need to begin with the definition of what a church is. Yeah. Because if we fail to understand why we exist as a church or why we exist as a believer, then that's, that's the problem. But if we begin to realize that we are a living organism, we should be growing, we should be multiplying, we should be reproducing, that's a different thing. And as you start ministry, wherever God will lead you, in whatever part of the world, in whatever people group to reach out, this should always be in your mind. Plant churches or you know, share the gospel, grow believers that will multiply. Plant churches that will multiply. 
There are churches that have been existing for the last 10 years, but never planted churches. Something's wrong. Because I, I believe every disciple should be making disciples, every church should be planting churches, and every leader should be reproducing leaders. If you're a real leader, you have to reproduce leaders. The reason why we lack great workers in our churches, we lack Bible study leaders, we lack Sunday school teachers, we lack, we lack people to do the ministry, is because leaders have not been reproducing. So we want to, and even as we start thinking of planting churches cross culturally in wherever context God will bring you, bear in mind, get believers, get your churches to be a living organism, growing, reproducing, multiplying. Otherwise, uh, I would say it's not really what God intended to be. God's intention is for us to really uh, see uh, the body of Christ grow and expand. So anyway, what should be needed for this to become a reality? A change of mindset, a change of paradigm, the way we think. As I was saying earlier, in most churches, they just disciple and they don't reproduce disciples. Leaders we have, but they don't actually reproduce leaders. Churches we have, but they don't actually plant churches. So something is wrong. We need to change our mindset. Because every leader should be reproducing leaders. Every disciple should be making disciples. Every church should be planting churches. So we need to have the Great Commission Christian mindset. What should be our mindset as a Christian? And one of the uh, trainings that we actually do, and part of it will be incorporated here, is what is called higher purpose, where you live, work, or study. We need to help believers in our churches or people that we disciple to realize that wherever God brings them, in whatever community or barangay or condominium units or subdivisions, that God will place them. God in His wisdom place them there with a higher purpose so that God you know, can use them to be witnesses for the gospel. Wherever you work, that might be in, the, in an office or in a, you know, in a shop or in a farm or wherever, in a call center, God place you there because you will also be God's strategic partner for people in your network of influence to come to Christ. Even where you study, I mean students, you know, uh, why are they studying, for example, in UP? Why not in, in La Salle or in Ateneo, right? Uh, I still am convinced that God in the Swiss have placed that student there because God has a higher purpose for the student. So wherever we are, we live, we, live, we work, we study, God in the Swiss have placed us where we are. Why am I a Filipino? Why are you not Filipinos? You know? So God is in the Swiss have chosen for you to be born in your, in your respective countries. And also God in His wisdom will place you where He wants to use you in your ministry. So whether you're a full-time missionary or just a full-time Christian, no, uh, then uh, what's important is for us to understand that wherever we live, work, or study, God has a higher purpose. What is the bottom line here? We need to first and foremost understand the priesthood of all believers. No, 1 Peter 2, 9, But you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of people called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Whether we believe it or not, we are a royal priesthood. That's who we are. No? And, and for what purpose? So that we may declare the praises of people called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. We who have been lost in sin, but remember redeemed. Call out once, redeemed, and now gathered together with a special purpose. We are a chosen people, the holy nation. What, what, what's the purpose? So that we can be scattered to declare the praises of people called us out of darkness in place marvelous As believers, we need to declare the greatness and the goodness of God in our lives. Sad to say that many Christians are not doing that. They just keep to themselves they're being Christians. They, they are called undercover Christians. <laughs> like detectives, but uh, the uh, people don't know their real identity. 
But as Christians, we need to declare the greatness and the goodness of God in our lives. In our workplace, in our communities, in our schools, this should be the mindset of every believer. We are a royal priesthood. So that's one thing we need to remember and we need to teach. However, uh, common lay people are being held hostage by this false doctrine. The Babylonian captivity of the church, uh, this is what Martin Luther would call it. Why? What was the practice then? Anything should always go to the priest, right? Remember the Holy of Holies? Several people 
It cannot be come up by a study group or a small group. So, uh, uh, don't go to the pastor. Hallelujah, pastor. Share the gospel to several people in my office. Now, doing follow-up, doing basic discipleship, can you come and handle a regular Bible study? No way. God takes you where you are because God can use you. So, that is skill you need to learn how to handle Bible studies or small, small group. The bigger the group, more skill would be necessary. The smaller the group, lesser skill. Right? So, we we'll try to use a very simple way. We call it company tree. Only three people, you and maybe two others, or you and another one, at least maximum of three. What's the advantage? Easy to meet. Secondly, not, not much skill for the facilitator. Number three, your schedule sometimes will have much. It is easier to match if you are only three. Safe also, because, because in restricted countries, meeting three is not a problem. More than ten, you need government a permit. No, so there are restrictions. So a lot of advantages. Besides, it's very simple. And then you will realize that if you if, that it's very easy, you can do it. So we want to create an environment in our ministries, in our churches, or our ministries, wherein we always give opportunities, equal opportunities, for people to make disciples through handling small groups. So three skills, okay? Share the gospel, making disciples, and handling a Bible study for a small group. Once you know these three, wherever God brings you, you will be amazed. Once you do it, whether you like it or not, you will be planting churches. <laughs> whether you like it or not, you will reproduce. Whether you like it or not, you know, you will be amazed. Because God will use you as a royal priest. Now, it's very interesting in 1 Peter 2 9 because it says you are a royal priesthood. If you back up four verses, 2 5, let's go back to verse 5. It says holy priesthood. So from holy priesthood, verse 5, in verse 9, royal priesthood. Why is this so? Well, it's interesting that Bible scholars said we are not just priests, but we are royal priesthood. And that actually meant highest level of priest possible. We are not a low class priest, but the highest level. This is what Bible scholars are saying. That, that's who we are. So when you go to the mission field or you go to where God wants you to go, you should bear in mind you are not just an ordinary holy priest, but you are a royal priest, the highest level of priest possible. Therefore, you will be amazed as you obey the Lord. Share the gospel, make disciples, start at the start small group that you will multiply churches. Not just one church, but you will multiply churches. Why? Because what's in your mind now is every disciple in my church will be making disciples. Every leader now will be reproducing leaders and every church will be planting churches. Even at the start, actually, you have to already cast the mission. We are to reproduce, we are to grow, we are to multiply. That's God's intention. Other churches, oh, now we celebrate our 10th anniversary. Let's begin talking about planting churches. Wrong. Because we need to disciple, you know, we need to evangelize, we need to make disciples, we need to plant churches as soon as possible. And as much as possible. So, you don't have to be a two-year-old Christian to begin sharing the gospel. In fact, the very first thing that, you know, uh, should be taught is for them also to, to tell others about what Christ has done for their lives. So there are many ways to be able to share the gospel. So anyway, we, we'll try to, to cover some. Uh, we, and of course, we have still uh, several months to be in the center for training. But there are, I know, more than 100 evangelistic tools. Now, I have a friend who invented uh, sharing the gospel using a basketball. You know, using a basketball. So it's like the bridge illustration. You know, you, you know, a basketball, uh, the way that the lines are, I think the, what do you call that? The, the design of the ball no, is made. It's something like that. So here, man is separated from God. There's a cup, God is holy. You know, and you, you notice that it's like this, you know? So there's the cross. 
representing Grace. So, Dad loves her so much. I mean, he did something like that. You say, oh, that's good. All right. Yeah. So, so like, it's like a bridge to the skill of Satan. But he is an athlete, so he said, oh, I can use a basketball. So even kids, we trained them up to share the password using basketball. Yeah, yeah. And yeah we, we did one training in General Santos City in Southern Mindanao. And, and this church who hosted the training, they said, we have a basketball court. Neighboring, you know, the neighbors will come and play, but we don't know how to reach out to them. That, we had a training in the morning, that very afternoon, all the kids who came in the church compound to play basketball heard the gospel using a basketball. Wow. Right. Okay. Anyway, a lot of ways. So uh, if they're more on the athletic side, then do something that would be of interest to them. So a lot of But try to get uh, and learn as many. Uh, and, and, you know, it's basically the same thing you say. It's only how you present it, you know, the, uh, the basic concept, actually. Number one is we are sinners. We cannot save ourselves, right? And so we need somebody to help us. Secondly, we can, since we cannot save ourselves, God in His love sent Jesus Christ. And Jesus paid for our sins. You know, when He died on the cross. And then, as we do that, then we need to acknowledge we're sinners and receive Christ as our Savior, the Lord. Okay, so those are very basic concepts that, uh, and they use it uh, in different ways. So they use like different tools. Yeah. So, uh, for example, uh, there's uh, you can use stories. Uh, there's the story of hope here, where you can actually use stories in, in the Bible. Uh, Twenty stories where you can share the gospel from the beginning, from Genesis, especially if they do not, if they don't have concept of God. So in the beginning, so it says here, uh, the most basic issue of human existence by declaring that something or someone has always existed is God. So in the beginning, before anything else, there is a God or somebody called God who existed. And then this is the same God who created everything. In the beginning, God created the heavens and there. So uh, I mean, these are 20 big stories in the Bible and then that would lead you to salvation. So there are, uh, there's another application that uh, we share your faith. So share your faith and then you can, you can actually start. There's an audio. God loves us. God wants to have a relationship with us. He wants to help us on our journey through life and into eternity. So you, you may not be able to really confidently say it, but you just use your God and then it will do the gospel presentation for you. Yeah. No? So, I, I mean, th there is so much now that we can use actually. So, we don't have reason to tell, I, I don't know how to share the gospel. Why, well, you, you know how to use your phone or your, your iPad? Then you can share the gospel. <laughs> okay? So, anyway, so share the gospel and then make the samples, prepare to work on that, and then handling a small group. Very easy. This afternoon will be a meet oh, Now, I already know how to, to handle a small group. Now I already know how to actually do uh, the very basic uh, discipleship, okay? Because the simpler the better. Bill, Dr. Bill Wright of Campus Crusade said, uh, we need to produce something that's transferable. The transferable concepts, he call it. Because the, the, the simpler, the easier to learn. The easier to learn, the easier to teach. And therefore, the easier to teach, it's very transferable. So we see more trained and equipped to share, to share and, and, and to do the ministry. So we, might, we would like to do that. Okay, but you are a royal priest, remember that. Mm -hmm. Highest level of priest possible. Don't ever underestimate yourself. Because Satan has been very, very, very successful in saying, hey, you're really nothing. Mm -hmm. no, you, you, God, uh, I mean, God cannot use you. You know, we tend to look at our limitations rather than look at God's infinite grace and wisdom and he said you are the royal priest whether we believe it or not that is the reality so as we make ourselves available we will be amazed that is the news that we